create a perfect world in our heads. There may be only minutes, seconds left of someone's life. Why waste time? Well, let me ask you something. You want it all, don't you? one thing they all need money now let's see if they're brave enough to earn it welcome back to another episode of resourceful agent radio show i'm your host andy silvius uh before we get started today i just want to remind everyone that you can find the full audio and video versions of this podcast on resourcefulagent.com uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please do me a favor and subscribe, like, and share with your friends. So today I have Justin Culliford back here again. Uh, Justin's the founder of Glasshouse Guide. And today we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit about app creation. You know, how do you get started creating an app? What do you do with it? Um, it was actually, this was a request from one of my listeners uh, from our episode that we did last time. He asked me if we could do an episode on on apps and everything. So. Thank you again for being back. Yeah, glad to be back. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, absolutely. So since we talked last, um, and we were kind of just chatting before we recorded here, but yeah. how's everything going? You know, life is good uh, in my world. I am involved with so many different work streams. You know, I was just sharing with Andy, you know, I told you just before we started recording, I just concluded a webinar with over 200 attendees for a COVID related um, infectious disease screening app that I'm involved with. Now I don't own that company, but I'm just involved as, um, as from a product management and product design perspective. So it's real. it feels good to put technology to work, to solve something, to help solve, not solve completely, but help solve something as complicated as the COVID situation. Right. So that's occupying a lot of good time. And then, you know, I was here before talking about Glasshouse Guide. We continue to have good, steady momentum on the Glasshouse Guide side of the house. Uh, we have our first international client up in uh, British Columbia, which is really exciting to say we're now international. So, you know, some really good things in the past few weeks. That's awesome. And uh, let's go ahead and plug your social media and website again, just in case somebody needs services for, well, whether it's app development, because I think you, you do take on some custom things, right? We do. We absolutely do. Uh, that's how we got our start was building for other people. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, we didn't get selfish. We just said, let's apply our own methodology to our own ideas. Right. But yeah, to reach out to us, uh, you can reach me. The easiest way to reach us is through glasshouseguide.com use the contact form, send us a message, whether it's about Glasshouse Guide or even your own app development, we are always happy to riff on ideas. And we have a lot of great uh, clients we've served that serve as references and good case studies. Awesome. So you guys better check them out. Go, give them, go hit them up if you guys need something developed. But So let's dive in a little bit to the overall process of developing an app. What goes into building something like that? Yeah, you know, it all starts with an idea. And I encourage folks who have ideas for apps uh, to write them down. And you never know when you're going to cross the opportunity where you can bring that, that idea to fruition. I talk to a lot of startups who have big, bold ideas and they just can't quite figure out where to start. Yeah. And writing it down, just getting it all out of your head and into words that someone off the street can understand is really, really the best place to start. And beyond that, with, when the idea is very, 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 very early, start drawing pictures, sketch it on paper. You know, it doesn't have to be super refined. You know, that whole phrase back of the napkin idea is a thing because truly so many great ideas are born on the back of a napkin that someone's just taken an ink pen and sketched out. So get those ideas out of your head and onto paper. That's the, that's the number one thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, I, I always write stuff down. I got notebooks sitting around here with ideas that may be good, may be terrible, whatever, but I still write them down because I, 
it's funny because I've, I've done it before where I've thought of cool ideas, whether it's marketing strategies, stuff like that for my business. I don't write them down and then I can't remember them by the end of the, end of the day because I get so busy. Then I'm trying to, you know, rack my brain trying to figure out what it was that I had the idea for. So yeah, same here. And I use, you know, I use, I'm an iPhone person and I use this constantly when I'm driving, you know, hands-free, you can still say, Hey, well, I won't say her name because right. I don't want it to ding, but you just say, Hey, and you send yourself an email. Yeah. And that's the easiest thing in the world to do is send yourself an email or set it as a reminder. And then, then it's captured. And then once it's captured, you can start getting into some of the more um, thoughtful planning activities and, and design activities. Yeah. You'll be able to re refresh your memory. So I was trying to look up some of the stats on, on apps and everything, but app creations have gone through the roof, you know, in the last 10 years, everybody used to have just websites. And then we started creating like an additional app add on. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say? Why is it more beneficial to have an app compared to just a website for your business? Well, one of the design, deciding factors when we go in and design a new app is to ask, how is it going to be used? So a good litmus test for you to decide whether to build it as a responsive website or an app. And let me explain. Responsive website means you build a website once and it reacts well as it shrinks down in form factor from desktop down to smartphone. Mm -hmm. It looks good on any device. So that's responsive website. Um, but if you need to leverage some of the hardware that's inherent to a device like the iPhone or, or an Android equivalent, then you might need to build it as an app instead. So if you're going to use the microphone, the camera, geo coordinates, um, any, anything that necessitates using the actual hardware of the device, you should probably build it as an app instead of responsive web. Now, if you want to get really, really nerdy, you can actually wrap a responsive website in a container and serve it up as an app. So that can actually be a way to expand your reach to audiences through the app stores, but still only have to maintain one code base. Um, when, when you have an idea for an app and you start talking with someone like me or, or another vendor to build it, ask them how many code bases they're going to have to maintain. A code base means a whole set of work, an original work, every time you enhance it. So that if you build for native, native app for an iPhone and Android, you have at least two code bases you must maintain. If you build it for responsive web, you only just have one and any device can open it. That's interesting. I didn't, I didn't realize it was like that. And I guess it makes sense. Um, you know, I've never created an app for myself, but I didn't realize that that was why we put them on the phones and stuff like that because you could use the hardware. So that's right. That's exactly right. And so here's the interesting thing too. Google has an approval process and Apple has an approval process. So when you make those changes, uh, it's very possible you could submit them for a review before they go live in the app stores and either Google and or Apple could uh, decline your submission. They may do a code review or a content review and say no, and the other one may say yes, but that's part of building a native app uh, inside of Android or iOS. What steps should someone take to, to I guess, um, get things approved and not have it get rejected from Apple or, or Google? Great question. Really, when you select a vendor to work with, as software engineers, they're going to know the rules of the road. They're going to know all of the latest criteria from Google and Apple to make sure that the app will clear that approval process. Or if for some reason it is rejected, they know how to navigate that hurdle. Uh, sometimes it's, net, it's rejected just because they need additional information or additional steps on how to test the app. Or it could be something that's policy driven. So great example, I mentioned that I'm involved with a COVID uh, related mobile application. It, it's actually not COVID centric it's it's actually for any infectious disease really but in our early prototypes and models that we submitted to apple we had covid mentioned in it and they they halted our submission and wanted more information and rightfully so they're being very careful with who puts something out in the app store about a topic that is so critically important 
And so we provided answers to those questions, resubmitted, and now of course we're cleared and in the App Store, but that's, that just shows you the level of scrutiny that they are applying to make sure what you're building really should be out there to their marketplace. Right. Now, on the topic of hiring a developer uh, to, to build an app, let's say you just have someone who, who goes on Google and starts searching, you know, who, who develops apps or whatever their question might be. What are some things that somebody should be careful of hiring developers? Are there things that people need to be aware of up front? Because there's a lot of people out there that aren't as tech savvy, and, but they may have the great idea to build an app. So the first place everybody goes, right, is Google. And That's that right. can also get you in trouble in some areas. Oh, it absolutely can. There are some great resources to do preliminary homework. There's a website, a company called Clutch, and you can search Clutch reviews. And that's like the Angie's list of developers and creative firms and marketing firms. So you can go out and search Clutch for providers in your area that have good ratings. That, that's one way to find providers uh, here in the United States for sure. Now, cost is always a factor. So you may be inclined to say, well, I can't afford to build this with a full-on engineering firm here in the United States or in North America. Maybe I should go offshore because everyone's heard of offshore development, right? It's, you know, there are lots of locations around the world that do offshore development. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. There are many good firms that do offshore development. I'm a bit hesitant, especially with some of the very original app ideas that people come up with. Uh, and the reason is we don't have the same protections overseas that we have here in North America and the United States. So if you have a great idea built overseas in, in certain countries, uh, the developer may build the code, deliver it to you, put it in the app store, but there are no protections preventing them from just cloning that code base and deploying it there locally. And now they've benefited from your great idea. So where you may have saved a lot of money in app development, you may lose, you may have an opportunity cost because they're siphoning off your business in other countries. So, you know, there, there, are, there are risks and rewards with any approach you take. I, I think the last point on selecting a firm would be as per references. Just like when you are meeting a real estate agent or you're meeting a mechanic or a carpenter, you like references, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing in our world, ask for our references, ask to speak with our clients and hear from them the good and the bad before you make a big decision. Well, yeah, I got to touch on that subject too about doing stuff overseas. I actually knew someone who had a physical product that they had created, created a, a design for, but it was cheaper to develop and have it built overseas. And for quite a few years, I think he was going on with, with this and selling it through his, his business and then realized that they had been duplicating it the whole time. And so he, a couple of years down the road, then realized, oh man, now I have, I have this other competition. It's the people that have been developing my, my product. So, I mean, it's yeah. the same, same thing. It's just in, in a, you know, a tech situation for an app. Uh, they, they don't care. They're going to make money on it. They're going to double end it essentially. That's exactly right. That's exactly it. And, and, you know, there are good reputable companies. There are mm -hmm. fine companies that do work overseas. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, in fact, I have a team that works for me that's based in Costa Rica. They are fantastic, highly ethical. They understand our business problems here in the United States. They work in our time zone and I can fly down there and be there in a couple of hours. Yeah. It's really, it's really like they're part of, of our country, except they have their own fantastic culture. Right. But, um, you know, when you start to look at other firms in other faraway places, definitely scrutinize their capabilities, uh, their ethics, and their, their backgrounds. You just want to ask lots of questions, speak to their current clients, and make sure that you're not walking into a situation. So what would, um, I guess, when I've talked to people about different ideas, a lot of people have in their head, oh, there's already thousands of apps out there. This is already done. This won't work. What would you say to the people who might be a little bit more pessimistic about building an app because they think that there's already competition in their, in their field? You know, it's actually a great place to be when you have competition already in the field because you can learn from what's worked well for them and what's not worked well for them, both from a, an app design and functionality perspective and also from a marketing and branding perspective. 
just pay lots of attention, Google those companies, search those companies, see what they're doing, and find out is there a way you can do something similar but better? And is, is the definition of better, whatever you come up with, compelling enough for someone to leave that platform and come to your platform instead? So, you know, you may create a better way to do online learning. You may uh, create a better way to do online gaming, whatever that is. Is it compelling enough to bring someone out of where, what they're accustomed to and into your world? So I, I actually think it's a huge benefit to just build a better mousetrap, right? Yeah. And benefit from all those, um, all that scrutiny those existing companies have gone through. Hey everyone, sorry to interrupt the show, but I've had a lot of people reach out to me lately and ask what programs I use to run my podcast. Uh, one of them that's super beneficial is Buzzsprout. It's a hosting platform to be able to host your podcast and then be able to produce it and put it onto different sites such as iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, all of those. So if you guys want to check it out, make sure to go to resourcefulagent.com, go to the resources tab, and from there you can find a link that will actually give you, I believe it's a $25 gift card to Amazon. And then there's a lot of other tools and um, resources in there for you if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or somebody looking to get into business. So thank you guys for listening. Enjoy the rest of the show. So with the, and I'm, I think I might get this wrong, the website, what, what was it you were calling before the website that had, that is. Oh, able clutch. To be, yeah. No, no, not that. When you create a website that can work on every device. Oh yes. Responsive. Sorry. So is it beneficial for people who have a responsive website to package their stuff up, put it into an app? Uh, would you recommend that in certain businesses? I mean, I know that it's a case by case basis, right? So it doesn't, what, what, what works for one business won't work for another, but is it beneficial if you, even if you don't need to use, utilize the hardware in a, a cell phone, is it beneficial to package that up into an app to reach a different customer base? I think it can be. Here's a great example. There is a, a construction company that we're, we've worked with and we designed some online forms for their people out in the field to take surveys and, and basically a checklist as they do routine maintenance out in the field for their clients. And so we actually packaged it into an app because on the, on the smartphones that the, the guys out in the field carry, it's a lot easier to just tap on an app icon, load the correct survey, and move on with their day. The exact same form is also available via a website. So if they get home in the evening, they didn't have time, maybe their phone wasn't charged, they can still get on their laptop or their desktop computer and complete the same form. We only had to build the form once, but we made it more accessible out in the field through the app icon. It, it was just, it was a win for that use case. So you want to think right. about how are folks going to use it? Where are they going to use it? Um, and just optimize for however you anticipate they'll use it. Yeah, it sounds like it could be con more convenient to have that on the phone than having, and I know there's some businesses that, you know, you got to go through the website and then it doesn't, isn't formatted for a cell phone or the print's really small. So at least the oh, app yeah. would would be built for that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good way to reach an audience. You know, most people, when they engage with a company, they go out to the app store and search that company's name. So me, right. I'm, I fly Delta Airlines. I went to the app store, searched Delta. Now I have the Delta app. I did not think so much, I guess just because of how I'm trained to go to delta.com on my phone. And I can probably do a lot of the same functions, but the app is just optimized for using it on the phone. As we're talking about this too, it just triggered me to think that you're in front of your client all the time if you have an app in their phone because it's, a, it's in their phone. They're going to swipe past it all the time when they're going to use other apps. And it's different than having to have them go to a website where they have to type it in and go to it because that doesn't Absolutely. always pop up. Oh, gosh, yeah. And you take a look at the apps on your phone and you you know, a lot of us will categorize them into containers. Like I have a container called news and weather on my home page of, or on my home screen of my phone. And inside of it are several different apps that I reference for, for those topics. Um, but you're exactly right. Inside of it, I am instantly already marketed by BBC, CNN, my local ABC station, USA Today. Um, and I'm giving away my sources of where I read stuff, but you know, <laughs> you are marketed to some extent. So let's right. say as a, as a real estate agent, you have a great app um, 
for Keller Williams. Let's just pick on Keller Williams. Mm -hmm. And you had the big red icon, KW on top. And, you know, now you're marketed right next to Zillow and Trulia and all the other apps in the same real estate on this page. So there is a compelling reason for someone to also tap your app in addition to those apps. Right. Instead of having to go the long route, type it in and then find it on their own. Exactly. Exactly. So here's the, here's the crystal ball question, right? Cause everyone's going to ask, what does it cost to develop an app? And I know that that is a very vague random question because you can have so many different things involved, but what's the generic rule of thumb? when you're creating an app? Well, it's, it's not cheap. It really isn't cheap. And I, and I think that there is an association with apps, websites, a lot of technologies today that because we see so many of them, that it must be less expensive, right? Um, if something is more common, then it should be less expensive in, in the real world. But um, it really can be rather expensive. You know, you may be able to find a college buddy or a friend who knows enough to get a proof of concept built, and they may do that for several hundred or a few thousand dollars. And that's very generous of them to do so. But you have to remember the cost is coming into play because you're paying for someone's experience. You're paying for someone who's been around the block, who's done this many, many times before. And though it may sound pretty expensive compared to other options, you're getting what you pay for. So I would say a, a good budget to have in mind, just go ahead and plan for at least 25,000 to get started with basic functionality because you're going to have not just the code, you're going to have the, the support and maintenance once the code is out there because things do have to be maintained. You don't build right. it and it's done. As app issues a new um, operating system, Apple issues the new iOS 15 or 16 or whatever's next, you're going to have to adjust the app. So there's maintenance involved. There's also the requirement to do custom graphics. You know, you're, it's beyond your logo, but every button, every side rail, every footer, header, everything is made in a custom manner if you want your app to not look like every other one on the street. Right. So you have to have a lot of design. So there's just a lot of things that add up because typically it's not a one person job to build a good app. You're going to need subject matter experts, someone who's good at back end code, stuff we never see, someone who's good at front end design, the stuff, the only stuff we see, and, and so many other disciplines that come together to make sure it's resilient, it works every time someone taps on it, and uh, it serves your clients the way you want to serve them. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I guess the follow-up question to that would be, we should be treating, if we're going to build an app of our own, we should treat it like a business, right? So there are ways to do many in-app purchases or advertising, right? So people could make the money back that they might have put into it, but it could be a self-generating income source. Oh, absolutely. You know, there's nothing that really feels any better than waking up in the morning and seeing that you've had several transactions overnight from yeah. people who have made in-app purchases or, or bought something through your app. Yeah, there are a lot of ways to monetize an app. Now, there's nothing wrong with building an app that is completely free and it's just out there for the betterment of the world. If you can afford to do that, keep doing that because we need those apps. But a lot of folks do need to make a return on their investment. And that's something where, you know, like a firm like ours will help think through ways to monetize an app to recoup your initial investment and hopefully set you on a good trajectory long-term also. So that is part of the process that your team does as a, uh, for developing apps? We do. There are, there are many firms, I'm not going to badmouth anyone by name, but there are many firms who will just listen to your idea and say, yeah, we'll build that and stop right there. We don't feel good about that. We don't need the business bad enough. We would rather go through a due diligence process with each person to understand what's the business model around this app. Uh, what does success look like for you? And also recommend things like, let's think beyond the code. What does it look like to market this? How are we going to spread the good word? Because just putting it in the app store isn't good enough. You really do have to think about promotion, advertising, and um, whether it goes out more organically or it's more of a push marketing, 
you have to think about those things and they, they do take money. Yeah. I love that you said that because I think that we all have the misconception or a lot of us at some point or another. Um, it's like building a website, right? You, your very first website you build, you build, you expect it, man, as soon as I hit that publish button, everyone's just going to start flocking to it. That's right. It doesn't work that way. And it doesn't, I don't mean to sound discouraging, but it does take time and effort to grow that organically. It's just like a social media channel. You know, people don't just start following you because you have it. It has to grow over time. That's exactly right. You know, when you, I've run into this myself, you know, as the founder of Glasshouse Guide, we built something that had never existed before. Mm -hmm. And so you would think, oh, this is the coolest new mousetrap. Everyone's going to want to, to use this thing. No, we actually have had to go through a huge promotion, a huge education, um, several work streams just to even reach the point of being considered. And that doesn't mean that we built the wrong thing. It just means we were early and there's a bit more legwork involved to, gain, to grow adoption of what we've created. So I think it's just important to take that honest assessment. This is not to be discouraging, but the exact same thing happened in Nike's earliest days, in Apple's earliest days, in Coca-Cola's earliest days. There had to be a phase where people didn't know what this brand meant or what the service meant and then had to adopt to it. They had to gravitate towards it. And a lot of work went into that over a lot of generations, but it's obviously work it, worth it. You know, I don't right. know who founded Nike way back when, but I wish I was one of their heirs. That would be kind of awesome. I'm not, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's the good work. It's great. They're building shoes that serve people doing a lot of tasks and they're also a, a vibrant company. So these things are worth doing and most of them, Goodness, uh, Coca-Cola was started in my hometown in Columbus, Georgia, a, a Pemberton's pharmacy. This pharmacist created this drink out of this one little pharmacy in Columbus, Georgia, and now it's a worldwide brand. It was worth doing, and it can be done. I think it's hard to recognize that everything starts somewhere, right? You look at Coca-Cola, and they're such a large, massive, I mean, they're worldwide. They're, they're just huge. But to think that that just started in one place and it was, it started with one person That's that right. created something and it just grew over time. And they just, I mean, they obviously had their marketing down because. <laughs> well, yeah, eventually they had to, right? Right. But you know, we get spoiled by so many stories. We see Elon Musk and we say, oh, okay, well, he's, he's a billionaire. So of course he can build rockets and of course he can build uh, electric cars and we hear you know, about Uber and Lyft and my goodness, the number of business meetings I've been in where companies pick, a, pick an industry, hospitality, communications, it doesn't matter. They say, we want to Uberfy the experience. And that's, well, I think that's good. That's a good evolution and I'm glad folks are paying attention, but even Uber started somewhere yep. and it didn't start that long ago. So there are still so many good ideas worth building right now not every good idea has been taken it's totally worth it to pursue those ideas and get them out there for evaluation do you think as the future of our technology develops that we will be more reliant on apps than we are on internet-based websites and stuff like that do you think at some point there will be a shift where we have uh, more of a need for the apps than we do for online i think we're going to see those confines disappear to some extent. So right now you go to a place to open an app, you go to a website to open a website. I think we're going to see those walls come down where you're instead just with your voice or with your eyes or with whatever you're touching on a screen, you're initiating an experience. You're just mm -hmm. saying out into the world, uh, Marriott, I want to book a hotel room. And it doesn't matter wherever you are, whatever needs is right in front of you, it's going to pop up and serve you. So that could be on a refrigerator that now has the screens built in. It could be on an Alexa device that has a screen or something without a screen completely like in your car. I just think we're going to reach a point more and more where we just issue a command out there or a desire or a wish or a want and the technology, whatever we're facing or, or interacting with at the time will serve it up to us. And we won't care if it's an app or a skill or a website. That's, right. that's coming fast. That's, that's next. Doesn't it blow you away how quickly things are progressing? Because I mean, what was it? 12 years ago, we, 
we really is that that's when the smartphones really started coming out and becoming uh, used every single day. And even those were terrible. I mean, I had like an HTC droid that was super slow, you yeah. know, I wasn't, I didn't have the money to go buy this, the nicest one, but at the time it just, it's crazy to me how quickly things have progressed in just a short period of time overall. Absolutely. But you know, don't, don't, don't be deceived that to think that a lot of those old technologies are gone. Just the other day I was having a conversation with someone and COBOL came up. COBOL is the old mainframe green screen or gold screen uh, mainframe interface technology. That's how they coded for those systems. Mm -hmm. And those systems are still in use right now as we're having this conversation. So great example, credit card processing. That's a world I've done a lot of work in. When you have billions of transactions per day going through these mainframe systems, only those mainframe systems can keep up with that sort of traffic and volume. And they are solid as a rock, but finding someone who knows how to code in COBOL is like finding a unicorn. They, they really? just, most of them have retired and moved on at this point, but there are a lot of 70, uh, 70 year olds who still know it and are making so much money because they can't be replaced. They're coming back as consultants making hundreds of thousands a year to maintain this old code that just hasn't been replaced yet. That's incredible. Because you would think at this point, you look at you look at our phones, you look at the devices we have in reality, right? Like we would think that all that stuff's gone because it's not out in front of us all the time. But it's pretty cool to hear that they're still running all that stuff. Oh, totally. When you make a purchase from your phone, let's say through the Amazon app, that transaction is, is making its way through the cycle, right? Your credit card is going to either be accepted or declined. Uh, that decision means it has to bounce all the way through interchange to a processor and that processor is probably using COBOL. So even though it's on this high tech iPhone 11 pro uh, and all of it seems to be happening in real time. Yeah, it is happening in real time and it's going through some old technology, which is ultimately getting replaced. Don't get me wrong. It's not going to be there forever, right? but it is amazing how much of it is still being used even today. Yeah. Well, this has been an awesome show. Uh, it's a little bit shorter than usual, but it's, uh, I think it's highly beneficial for people who are in business, whatever, you know, I've looked into developing apps before. We had a conversation last time after we ended our, our last episode, because I just wanted to see like, is that a possibility if I had ideas that could be developed? And you said, absolutely. Oh, 100%. and I want to, I also want to mention really quick too. I mean, you had brought up that you'll sign non-disclosure agreements. Like you're not you know, you're super out front, up front about everything that it's all private and it's not, you're not, no one has to worry about their idea being lost to somebody else. No, not at all. And, and, you know, when you think through evaluating a firm to work with, to bring your idea to life, uh, for, you know, take a measured approach, shoot for a proof of concept first. Don't try to take over the world. Uh, don't try to eat the elephant in one bite, build your proof of concept, go with a firm that has a good reputation one that proactively encourages a non-disclosure agreement and one that is very transparent from a pricing perspective. Don't waste their time and don't let them waste your time. Right. Well, awesome, man. And then your website, again, I want to repeat it for everyone still listening, um, glasshouseguide.com, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to reach us. That's uh, one of our products and it, it all comes back. I, that's a great way to reach out to us. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so... All you guys listening, I highly suggest if you've ever had an idea for an app, please reach out to Justin. He will take care of you. So uh, the goal of this podcast is to provide solutions and influence others in business, real estate, finances, and personal development. If you guys have any suggestions or any topics you'd like me to cover on here, go ahead and just drop me a message at resourcefulagent.com or on Facebook and Instagram at resourcefulagent. Thank you guys. We'll see you on the next episode. Did you find what you were looking for? I've got some work to do.